Uh, today, Fabian invited me for this seminar, and I chose to uh, present some of the work that involves uh, almost two decades of work, actually, um, related to a specific pathology of the brain that is known as a Huntington's disease. Um, and the use that we made of marine organisms to discover some very important information or what we believe is very inform uh, important information about the pathogenesis of the disease. I'm going to go fast because I think I tried to put too much in this presentation, but if we are running out of time, I'm happy to cut it off. So um, just for those of you that never heard of Huntington's disease, this is a disease that was described back in 1872. So we have been dealing with this, uh, with the knowledge of this disease for a really, really, really long time. Uh, and it wasn't known until 1993 that the disease uh, is caused by mutations on a single gene, which makes the disease so-called monogenic. But despite the fact that we have been almost 30 years since the discovery of the gene, we still know very little about how mutations in this gene that is known hunt as Huntington causes disease. So this is a brief summary of some of the uh, symptoms of these uh, affected patients. They typically start late in life, which is a mystery. Why is it something, uh, as it happened with other diseases, there's an aging component that appears to, to have an important role. Um, uh, and some of the symptoms, the most uh, well-characterized one is one that uh, involves hyperkinetic movements that are described as chorea. Chorea in Greek means dancing. Uh, and these tend to be rather late effects that also involve cognitive um, uh, issues and uh, certain forms of dementia. One that is an earlier one and appears to correlate better with the disease progression is the ability to maintain a certain movement, which is for neurologists is known as motor persistence. Suffice it to say that this is a devastating disease uh, where people can really um, take up to 17 years before they die of the disease with very, very um, uh, severe consequences. Uh, some people uh, have referred to Huntington's as having ALS and Alzheimer together. And I think that actually that's not a, an inaccurate description. Uh, here's a representation of the Huntington gene, the gene that when mutated causes Huntington's disease. It's a very long protein with very little homology to other proteins except for some regions here in blue that are known as heat repeats. I'm not going to talk much about that. But as you can see, 3,144 amino acids, this is a very long um, uh, protein. And what really causes disease is this region in yellow here that corresponds to a polyglutamine domain that is located at the amino terminus of the protein. Normally, hopefully for everyone here, we have polymorphic uh, poly-Q track that ranges between 8 and 35. But what is remarkable is that uh, as this uh, uh, repeat, sometimes undergo abnormal expansion through mechanisms that I'm not going to be able to discuss here, and it reaches the threshold of 36 glutamines, you had a mutant Huntington's disease allele, means that you're going to be transmitted a form, a pathological form, of the, uh, of the gene that will pass into your inheritance with 50% chance because it's autosomal dominant, uh, the pattern of inheritance. And autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance for you, those of you that have done some of this um, genetic work, it typically supports a toxic gain of function mechanism. The problem with this protein is that it really, we don't know the normal function, so that makes it really challenging for researchers to know what exactly goes wrong in the context of the disease. Several features uh, complicate in mother's words. Uh, this protein is ubiquitously expressed in many different tissues. As I'm gonna show before, there are some neurons that are more vulnerable to others to this mutation. Another feature of the disease is the formation of aggregates that have been long uh, been thought to be the culprit of the toxic actions of this protein. But there's very little we know, despite 30 years of research on this. So, uh, so that tells you the complexity of the problem. For many years, all what we knew about Huntington's disease uh, before the gene was identified was just what we could gather from brains of advanced patients that were collected and analyzed. And this comparison that I put here is just to illustrate the massive degeneration and thinning of the cortex that you see here in this control sample versus the Huntington's disease. You also see a massive reduction in the striatum and the caudate and the putamen. It's a structure of the basal ganglia. And associated with that degeneration, you see uh, the enlargement of the ventricles that grow at the expense of the nervous tissue. 
But this is, again, this is the end product of the disease. This is very late in the disease. So now we know the mutation. We know the things that happen very late in the disease. And what we aim to, to do is to try to identify what is the sequence of, what is the pathogenic cascade here, and what things can we find earlier in the process that allowed us to have some kind of intervention. And what I'm showing you here is the cellular topography of HD, which has been mainly uh, um, uh, deducted from electrophysiology experiments. Uh, there's some anatomy experiments, but again, those refer to post-mortem samples that are very late in the process. And what we observe here is basically there's a significant degeneration of axons uh, apparently, at least from the electrophysiological data, the actions the project from the cortex to the striatum and striatum neurons the project to other areas of the basal ganglia, such as the globus pallidus, internals and external side. So these are, this is represented by these dashed lines here. So when electrophysiologists record in this structure by stimulating there, they, they notice this problem. It's very clear that there were issues with corticostriatal connectivity. What it was missing there is a very good visualization of this loss of connectivity. What is the substrate and the basis for this loss of connectivity? So in an effort to, to, do, to, to bring, shed some light on this, we took advantage of what is the oldest and more widely used model of Huntington's disease. There are many, many different models. They all have advantages and disadvantages. This one is particularly one good to study the toxic functions of the transgene uh, transgenic protein. So in this mouse, uh, they have the normal copy of Huntington, otherwise they will be embryonic lethal if you knock it down. And they express a short version of Huntington, which con uh, consists of the amino terminus. Two major regions, the amino terminus, the polyglutamine tract that I referred to, and another region that I'm going to refer later in the talk, which is known as proline rich region because of uh, over 40 amino acids, 30 of them correspond to proteins in this sequence. By expressing this small transgene, this mouse undergo, this mouse uh, uh, develop very early on uh, a number of different um, uh, pathological features that resemble uh, HD, but of course, you know, is the best approximation that we can do in mice. Uh, here are some of the uh, phenotypes. This mice very early in life, they already have problem building nests in the cages. They don't work as well when they are putting rotor rod assays that measure locomotor activity. They develop a rather non-specific phenotype common to many uh, neurodegenerative disease models, which is this clasping phenotype. And they only live for up, up to 92 days for this particular one that has 160 glutamines. So it's a fairly long, long pathogenic tract that we force these mice to express. Nevertheless, we have learned a lot about this system and being relatively new and not absolutely rich in funding at the time, we decided to focus on, the, on these animals uh, for, the, uh, for convenience and availability. So the first thing we wanted to do is to examine uh, if that uh, loss of corticostriatal connectivity that has been reported has a, uh, a cellular substrate uh, meaning that there are axons that are degenerating. Although there were reports of those, they were mostly isolated. So what we did, we took these R62 mice that I just described, and we crossed them with a homozygous mouse that express YFP throughout the brain in some areas more than others, and it's an homozygous. So uh, with that, we obtained uh, control mice, which express the YFP alone, and mice that express also the uh, transgenic uh, Huntington protein, okay, the fragment that I referred to. You can see how nice the neurons light up in the brains of these animals without even doing any form of staining. Uh, this is the corpus callosum, which is the largest bundles of axons connecting the two hemispheres, and they also, uh, the axons look uh, really, really nicely delineated in this mouse model. So what we saw when we uh, compare the YFP mice to the uh, YFP R62 mice. And you can see right away, uh, there's some differences, but when you count the number of neurons in the cortex, there's actually no, no changes, no, no obvious loss of neurons up to 90 days. These guys are very close to start dying, but when we counted the number of neurons, there were no differences. Nevertheless, we saw this dramatic reduction in yellow background throughout the entire cortex which is better seen here. This is the control and this is the RC2 mice that strongly suggested that some, uh, some neuropil was degenerating. 
when we move into the colossal uh, axons, you can see that at three different time points, the wild types, all these axons are nicely organized in bundles, uh, very beautiful up to even much older ages. But when, you, we act, when we analyzed the R62 YFP mass, we saw something very different. We saw that already at 30 days old, there was some uh, changes in the organization of this callosum, uh, a reduction in overall fluorescence and the morphology, the filamentous morphology of these axons. It was lost by, by day 90 significantly. And we can quantify that because the inherent fluorescent, uh, fluorescence of these axons allowed us to do so. And we saw in all cases, regardless of the length of the expansion, that there was a dramatic reduction in the, um, uh, in the fluorescence, uh, in the way of P fluorescence. Uh, if you cut now, I should have mentioned these are coronal sections of the cor corpus callosum, meaning this is the type of section that you, you, you obtain. But if you cut the brains in sagittal section, in this case, the axons are coming towards you in the screen, the blue, uh, DAPI here marks the oligodendrocytes in this particular area. And you can see there is a very dramatic reduction in the number of uh, YFP positive structures here, again, suggestive of um, degeneration. We were worried that uh, there might be something strange that happened with the protein rather than really reflecting axonal changes. So we had to go do electron microscopy where we found that these axons are much smaller in the R62 than they are in the YFP or in the control mouse at 90 days of age. And this, this is the quantitation of that. So now um, I would like to introduce the idea for many of you that have been um, thinking about neuronal cell death in this disease, that this rather represents the final end product of a pathogenic cascade. But what the animal models, uh, including the contribution that we did to visualize directly this degeneration, it strongly suggests that these neurons degenerate following uh, what is called a dying back pattern of degeneration, where problems in the, um, in the synapses and the axonal pathology occur much early in the course of the disease. So, uh, so now we can start adding some uh, steps in our pathogenic cascades that we started first and mentioned that axonal degeneration is definitely uh, an event that preset precedes the loss of neurons, at least in this mouse and many others that other people looked at. But the question comes, how is it that uh, this expansion in the polyglutamine tract of Huntington uh, uh, mediates this axonal degeneration? And there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, there's many processes that are, have been reportedly compromised by this protein, mitochondrial function, um, oxidation, there's a number of uh, ideas out there as, as to what could cause uh, degeneration of neurons in Huntington. But what we knew already uh, is that there was a process that, that involves the translocation of materials from the cell body all the way to the synaptic terminus, back and forward. I'm not going to have time to talk too much about the motor proteins that Fabian referred to in the beginning of this talk, but it's a lot of what we know today. And we know that uh, soon after synthesis, most proteins have to be transported to the final sites of, uh, of utilization, far in the synaptic terminals, on different compartments, by this motor that is known as conventional kinesin, and vice versa, trophic factors, defective organelles, and a number of other uh, uh, organelle cargos are transported back to the cell body by this complex motor protein complex known as uh, cytoplasmic dynein. Each one of them is composed of more than one protein subunit. I'm going to refer to that in a minute. So I s it is not hard to uh, understand from the importance of these motor proteins that if they fail, there's going to be some form of pathology. And, and today we have strong genetic evidence linking deficits in these motor proteins uh, to a number of different diseases all of which feature this dying back degeneration of neurons, meaning there's a lot, there's synaptic def deficits, there's pathology of action long before we lost these neurons. So the genetics is showing, for example, mutations in kinesin can lead to degeneration of uh, long corticospinal motor neurons. Some mutations in dining can affect striatal neurons or sensory neurons. And so there's some implications about the fact that some cells are more reliant 
on a specific motors than others. And I won't have time to talk too much about that. But you, the thing, take home message from this slide is that deficits in this process can cause dying back degeneration, which is what I just show you seem to happen in Huntington's disease. So a number of years ago, uh, many years ago, <laughs> we decided to ask the question as to how does this mutant Huntington uh, or whether this mutant Huntington protein affects this cellular process that is so critical for synaptic function and the maintenance of axons. And that's not a trivial question because despite the availability of many, many different species, we all fall into the problem that for the most part, when you apply uh, transgenes or you use molecular constructs, they have to be synthesized in the cell body of these neurons. So if you have any effects in the axon, you never know 100% sure whether those deficits occur because there's some problems in the cell body where these organelles are, are made before shipment, or if there's some local effects on this long axonal compartment. But there's one exception to this rule, and that brings me to the marine organism that my um, uh, presentation referred to, which is my colleague, this squid loligopilii. Every year I travel all the way from Chicago to uh, the East Coast to work with these guys. Uh, which I believe that are very, very important, have made already major contributions to neurobiology. So this is one uh, former uh, technician in the lab holding one of those squids that we work throughout the summer. Let me tell you, unless you eat your mice, I can assure you that it's much nicer to work with a squid because after the experiments, you can cook some delicious meal. So um, uh, I challenge anybody <laughs> to move to or try to take advantage of this process, not just for the... Um, for the data that you get from it, but we try to use them uh, beyond that. And some of my colleagues uh, argue that this creature has thrived for millions of years of evolution for us to study neuroscience. And just to give you a few of the examples of things that were discovered through this system, uh, the action potential actually uh, gave uh, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley the Nobel Prize, the discovery of the action potential in this model. Uh, the discovery of the motor proteins was also done in this system. And much of what we know about synaptic transmission was also discovered in the squid. So this is not a creature that you can underestimate in terms of the contributions that have made in science. Here's a slide uh, showing uh, very quickly how we prepare these giant axons and the axoplasm preparation. So you take a squid and you can dissect these axons with naked eye. Uh, and here's a student of mine holding one of those axons with two threads, and you can see that it's fairly long, a single axon, two to three centimeters long, and about half a millimeter in diameter. What it makes the preparation particularly um, uh, wonderful is the fact that you can mechanically extrude the interior of this axon and, uh, and remove the plasma membrane and put this in a small chamber with no dilution. So you're basically looking at what happened in this axon ex vivo for up to 24 hours if you provide ATP. Uh, you can actually do biochemistry with these axons or you can do microscopy. This line that you see here is a single axon that has been just placed on a chamber to give an idea of how large they are. But by, we can extrude them like you do a sausage from the skin and this maintains the exact form. It's not the water that falls on the sides, but it's just a cylinder of gel, very rich in proteins that continues alive, as I'm gonna show you in a video. The fact that we don't have plasma membrane now gives us a luxury uh, in comparison to many other systems because we can precisely put the uh, compounds in, uh, such as recombinant proteins, pharmacological inhibitors, peptides. There's no problem with the plasma membrane being in between. So we get very accurate control of what we place in this preparation. So this is a little bit, I put this video here to tell you how this works. Basically we can measure the amount of material and the speed of material that moves from the cell body towards the terminals. And the other way around, which you can observe here, this, these larger ones are mitochondria. And you can see this is very, very impressive, the amount of time. This is real-time video. It hasn't been frame average. This flow of vesicles uh, occurs and is maintained for up to a day in this preparation. We, what is more important is that we can actually, uh, by matching uh, some cursors there, um, if the video wants to help me, uh, we can actually get quantitative measures of vesicles that move 
in the anterograde direction and in the retrograde direction. And that's what this plot shows here. So these are the cursors that we adjust. We can get the rates of movement for each one. Each one of these is a value that we obtain throughout, an throughout the course of the experiment that lasts about an hour. And this will be a classical control uh, experiment where the line blues there represent material move from the cell body to the terminals by, uh, by conventional kinesin, the motor that I introduced before, and vice versa, there's transport of ca cargo that goes back to the cell body uh, and is carried by cytoplasmic dynamics. So this is what it looks like uh, a, a control experiment if we put the buffer that resembles the composition of the axoplasm. So, um, so I still want to remind you, we're trying to answer the question as to whether a mutant handedog can affect this uh, process. And we got a hold of numerous proteins expressing the full length handedog has been a challenge. Only a few groups have done it. So we started with a number of different fragments and we found that actually proteins as short as the region of the gene that is encoded by exon one is where the toxic uh, element of this protein uh, is present because you already know that this looks like a, the control pro, uh, experiment that I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, there's no major changes in either anterograde or, or retrograde transport. When we, but when we put mutant forms of Huntington, we see a dramatic reduction in the number of vesicles moving in both directions. So this was exciting. But I, I put this slide here to convince you that this system is not a binary system of whether it inhibits or not. The proteins that we have tested so far, they all have a different uh, profile in this system. Uh, for example, if you put filamentous of tau, you see a dramatic reduction that is selective only for anterograde, anterograde transport, but there's no effects on retrograde. Uh, uh, I'm not gonna talk about all the proteins that we tested, but we have situations where actually retrograde transport increases. So this is just to illustrate the fact that this data alone and the different uh, profiles of inhibition that we see with different uh, neuropathogenic proteins that we tested in this system is quite different, suggesting that different mechanisms lead to these deficits. So after our first report back in 2003, I can't believe that so much time has passed, but it did, uh, others follow up and expanded on these uh, findings and demonstrated these problems in axonal transport in drosophila in cultured neurons, so that was a very encouraging. But the question was begging, how does this mutant Huntington inhibit axonal transport? At the time, there were many different ideas, one that include the sequestration of motor proteins by uh, Huntington aggregates, or the aggregates themselves will clog the axons. We knew that these were very unlikely to be the reasons for why we saw those effects, because the proteins were perfused at the nanomolar level when the motor proteins there are in the micromolar level, about one micromolar level. So it will be impossible for something that is several orders of magnitude lower concentration to have any effect on a massive effect on the vesicles that are moving. So there was another idea that somehow this Huntington protein was acting as a scaffolding for motor proteins. And I'm gonna go very quickly to this because we were unable to confirm any of these car uh, cartoonish models that have been put out, out in the literature. We can immunoprecipitate Huntington very nice from both wild type and R62 mice, and um, we found no traces of any of the motor proteins that we examined that I presented before. There's no kinesin, he either heavy chains or light chains of kinesin. Conversely, we can immunoprecipitate kinesin, and we nicely bring the subunits of kinesin, but we bring no Huntington and uh, with the dining is the same. So we basically using endogenous material, we saw no evidence that there was a direct interaction between mutant Huntington protein and the motors that execute axonal transport. In fact, you can nicely, through several rounds of immunoprecipitation, almost completely deplete kinesin, and the levels of Huntington, as you can see here, remain basically unchanged. So there's nothing along the lines of stoichiometric binding. The light chains of kinesin do disappear, but well, that's what you expect. Um, so that wasn't a mechanism. But by the time that we were doing this experiment, we have already built up quite a bit of knowledge on a novel mechanism for axon and transport regulation, which involved the actions of protein kinases. 
and that's a schematic here. We were able to map multiple kinases uh, that phosphorylate these motor proteins, different subunits of these motor proteins, whether it's kinesin or dynein, and by doing so, they affect the functional activity of these motor proteins. So back to the question, I already showed you this slide that is uh, axoplasms where the wild type form of the protein has been perfused, there's no effect. We already showed that when we perfuse the mutant antidote, we have a dramatic effect. But when we started, uh, at that time, I was uh, 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 just started my lab and we went through the whole Cal Biochem catalog look, looking for differ, different uh, kinase inhibitors. And I'm not gonna show the ones that did not work, but I'm gonna show you one that did work, which is an inhibitor of junk kinases. When you now put this same mutant protein, mutant antidote protein in the axoplasm, but in the presence of an inhibitor of junk kinases, you prevent the effect on transport. So that was suggesting the junk kinases were involved in this. And we didn't do just with one pharmacological inhibitors, but we did it with peptides inhibitors, because we all know uh, that the longer that an inhibitor stays in the market, the more you discover some non-specific actions. So we never really stay with a single inhibitor alone. So all of these two actions were also uh, perfused with the same mutant protein here and two different junk inhibitors. And in both cases, we can prevent this effect. So now we can say that uh, we start adding elements to our story and we can see that somehow the expansion of, uh, mutant, uh, of the polyglutamine drug in Huntington promotes activation of junks, which in turn inhibit axonal transport. Uh, axonal degeneration will proceed as we show in the R62 mice and that will lead to neuronal cell death. Uh, thanks to the squid, uh, I'm sure many in the audience uh, have already heard about junk kinases as stress-activated protein kinases, but less often you hear about the different isoforms of junk. Thanks to the squid, we were able to test what was the effect of different junk kinases on axonal transport, and we found that the most abundant one, were the one that is the focus of most researchers today, the junk one, when we perfused that in the axoplasm, we found no effect whatsoever on transport. JUNK2 has some mild effects on, especially on anterograde transport that we haven't been able to pursue due to the lack of resources. But the JUNK3, which is the last isoform that we test, it really resembled the effects of mutant Huntington in the sense that both anterograde and retrograde transport were compromised. Uh, this is published data, so I'm not going to go much. You have to take my word for it. But how does this connect with the deficit in transport that we saw? We went on to show that these junk tree kinases phosphorylate uh, a critical domain in the motor protein of kinesin. This is a dimer uh, that is actually interacting with the microtubules. So when we tested the consequences of phosphorylation of kinesin by junk tree, we found that the kinesins after phosphorylation, they no longer can move along the axons uh, because this interaction with the microtubules that allowed the processive movement of organelles was compromised. So just to wrap up this first uh, uh, part of the talk, we have learned that mutant antidotes somehow activate junk kinases. We learned that uh, from those kinases, junk tree appears to mediate the toxic effect of mutant antidote. We found a, su a substrate in one of the molecular motors. We never were able to still look at the effect, potential effects of junk tree on retro transport, but that's something that we really would like to do. And we even map a specific site of kinesin that was targeted by this kinase, okay? So this schematic shows that, and the reason that there are some pointing to the cell body is that this kinase is junk, are very well known to activate transcription factors and deregulation of transcription is a major signature of this disease. So our findings were consistent with the junk kinases being activated by mutant antidote and causing different effects depending on the compartment where they are acting, okay? In the case of the axon, they will inhibit tran axonal transport, but very likely abnormal activation of these kinases in the cell body will lead to transcriptional changes there are some of the features, hallmarks of the disease. So this is all good, but the question is, what does it have to do with this? Is this just a squid? Is this something that we can actually uh, use for, for us, for the human disease or for the animal models? This is something that I heard a lot of my grants at the time, <laughs> the skeptic reviewers that will not like it just simply because it's squid. But I'm gonna show you before, this guy has given us some important clues, I believe, 
in the pathogenesis of the disease. So uh, we learned from the squid axoplasm the junks were activated. So a postdoc in the lab, Mercedes Priego, decided to look in that model, the R62, whether there was activation of junk kinases, and she found activation of, uh, of kinases both in the, in the, cort in the cortex and actually, um, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to put this one, but she went on to show that that also occurs in samples from AD, uh, Huntington disease patient, suggesting that activation of junks, it, it, uh, it's a disease relevant event in Huntington's disease. This is the, the human brains. We see a dramatic activation of junk kinases with this antibody that recognized the active form of junks. Uh, and that uh, uh, did not correlate with the loss of the total protein as is shown with this junk tree uh, antibody. So basically, take home message is that when the squid uh, predicted that junk were activated, we were able to confirm in the R62 model, a couple of other uh, animal models, and even in, in HD tissue, suggesting that this is a disease relevant event. But the question that was begging to be answered is does junk tree really uh, contribute at all to the neuronal pathology that we observe in vivo. And to answer this question, we have to do genetic crosses, and we actually went on, um, that are not described here, to, do, to prepare three different experimental groups. One is the naive mice, uh, the other one is the R62 mice, which still has the junk tree in them, and then we generated R62 mice that do not have junk tree, okay, to evaluate what the contribution of this molecule in vivo. And a summary of those results you can see here is quite striking in why the, the naive, the red in, uh, it indicates R62, and the blue lines, uh, columns represent the R62 that no longer has JAN3. So if we put the mice in, under this nesting assay where they tend to destroy this nest to create a nest inside the, uh, their cage, we can see that uh, while uh, R62 mice, um, sorry, this is, this is uh, the R62 mice, they don't have much motivation uh, to really disassemble that nest. But when we were deleting junk tree, there was a significant recovery uh, in this uh, behavioral assay. When we put those mice to walk on a rotor rod to measure the locomotor activity, you see that the R62 mice very early on already have a significant decrease in uh, locomotor performance that is very much improved upon deletion of the junk tree. And that was done at two different ages. And then this clasping phenotype that I mentioned to you uh, that occurs when you lift the mouse for the tail, they tend to put together all the limbs. Uh, and that was actually also prevented by deletion of junk tree in the R62 mice. The wild type is not drawn here because they never actually do the clasping. So that's what we found in three different behavioral assays. And we actually found there was even a significant increase in the survival of these mice that we're from 90 or 90, so, 90 something days up to 120. So there was something really that was um, depending on junk tree in this model. So we can confidently say that there's a role of junk tree in the pathology of these mice. But the question that we did not answer is whether this amelioration of the phenotype that we uh, achieved by, uh, by knocking down junk tree had anything to do with the axonal degeneration that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. So what we did was to take samples from a striatum, which is um, actually a rich in this marker v glute one This v glute one is producing cortical cells and is present in this synapses. So if you do biochemical analysis of those of striatum tissue, you see that there's a dramatic reduction in, R6, in the R62 levels of this protein are dramatically reduced in the striatum of R62 because these uh, axons are degenerating. Uh, but when we put R62 Gen3, we have a significant recovery in the amount of this corticostriatal terminal marker. Okay, so this is indirect evidence that there was some improvement in axonal degeneration uh, in these mice. And my colleague, Kuei Sen at our university, uh, also showed this with electrophysiological procedures that I'm gonna describe very brief, briefly. But when you measure the striatum uh, uh, using patch clamp recordings, you see a dramatic reaction in the, uh, increase in the excitability of R62 neurons that is consistent with this degeneration. And upon deletion of junk tree, we also recover the functional uh, properties of the MSNs. 
So all of this was suggesting that somehow we were preserving these axons, but this evidence was rather indirect. So we took the hard approach and we crossed these uh, three genotypes that I show in the slide before with YFP mice to see if this was con uh, concurrent with preventing axonal degeneration. And this is what is shown in this slide. So we have the YFP mice, the YFP R62, and the YFP R62 that it doesn't have JAN3. And you can see by the amount of yellow here that the dramatic reduction in axon uh, caliber and number that we see in the R62 is significantly recovered upon deletion of the JAN3. So we can say confidently that at least one of the things that get ameliorated uh, besides the behavioral phenotypes at the cellular level is that we seem to be preserving axons uh, to a significant extent by removing this kinase. So that brings us now uh, a potential therapeutic component to try to prevent the loss of axonal connectivity in this uh, mouse model and others. Um, but also, as is usually happened with any discovery, you have more questions that come up. Uh, and in this case was, how in the world does expansion of a polyglutamine tract in a protein activates the junk kinases? So we move our questions upstream in this uh, pathway that we draw here. The junk pathway is a phosphor relay uh, a pathway that involves MAP kinase, kinase, kinases, MAP kinases, and finally MAP, uh, sorry, MAP kinase, kinases, and MAP kinases. Each one of these um, groups that I found here, and they're not all uh, shown in this figure, can uh, phosphor, each one of these kinases, MAP kinase, 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 or MAP3 kinases, can phosphorylate a downstream kinase that in turn activates junk. This is so-called the canonical junk pathway. So um, we wanted to know if this is really what we, we were seeing in the squid. And I had a, a graduate student at the time that was able to identify antibodies that work in the squid. And what we saw is that if you take these two axons, there are three, uh, three pairs of axons from the squid that we got here. And you can see that every time we perfuse uh, uh, Huntington proteins with a pathogenic tract over 36, in this case, the mutant has 50 feet, 55 uh, glutamine versus the wild type, we see a dramatic activation of this upstream kinase MKK7 that is the one that I just show you here. So this was telling us that yes, this is, these junks appear to be activated through the canonical pathway. But still, how do you actually uh, uh, go from expansion of the glutamine domain to activation of this MAP3 kinase? That was a question that we wanted to solve. And to really um, get some information on potential mechanisms, what we did was to perfuse in this axoplasm preparation a, 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 a number of different constructs of different lengths uh, and long story short is that uh, the most toxic element is exactly what the R62 mice uh, expressed uh, in their transgene, which is this exon 1. It's, the, it's a protein that is encoded by exon 1 of the mutant Huntington. When you put that, that suffices to inhibit transport dramatically. But here was the first surprise that we had because we thought, oh, this has to do with the, with the polyglutamine domain that we have this effect. But if we now present the exact, exact same glutamine domain that we have here, in the absence of the adjacent proline-rich domain, we have no effect. So that was actually very curious to us and actually motivated us to try to understand how this worked. Um, we were not happy just by simply deleting proteins. We took a different approach where we have antibodies that recognize the polyglutamine tract and antibodies that recognize the proline rich domain. Uh, uh, and, and we actually co perfuse these proteins with either the antibodies that uh, uh, bound to the proline rich domain or antibodies that bind to the polyglutamine domain. And what you can see here is that despite the presence of exon 1 protein here, if you pre incubate that uh, uh, protein with the proline rich, uh, with antibodies that uh, code the proline rich region, we no longer have the effect on transport that I reported earlier on. In contrast, if you do incubate this protein with antibodies that recognize the glutamine domain, you still have the effect. This is strongly suggested that something has to be recruited to the proline rich domain, something that the antibodies prevented here from binding. And that was consistent with some uh, FRED studies that were put uh, forward by my colleague, uh, Nick Caron, 
uh, which show that uh, basically expansion of the polycute tract here that you can see here, it has an impact on the exposure of this proline region. Okay, so, the, um, so all of this pointed to the fact that the toxic domain was somewhere located in the proline-rich region of Huntington. But what does it have to do this with the activation of channels? Well, back then, trying to learn about the uh, nomenclature of the MAP3 kinases, which is actually not something fun to do. <laughs> the, numblex, the names are very complex, uh, and there's a number of different families of MAP kinases. But when I started learning about them, there was one that caught my eye, which is this subfamily of mixed lineage kinases. And why did that call my attention? Because these kinases have a very interesting uh, uh, design, molecular design, that resembles the one for many kinases. Kinases are not meant to be constantly activated, but rather transiently activated. And many times to uh, achieve that transient activation, they rely on intramolecular interactions. And some of the students that are here now, I'm sure that they heard the archetypical example like SARP kinases, where they have like the phosphotidosine binding domain at the carboxy terminus of the protein, binding into another uh, SH2 domain that is inside the protein. And by doing this uh, folding, the protein no longer can phosphorylate substrates, or it does, but very, very transiently. The tendency of most kinases is to undergo inactivation by intramolecular interaction. So this MLK3 was not an exception but what, is, what it allows that intramolecular interaction in the case of, of, of MLKs is an SH3 domain that is located at the amino terminus of the protein that interacts with a proline-rich region internal to the uh, in, in other area of the kinase. So this is how MLKs are for the most part, and you may recall that from, from your uh, biochemistry. So this intramolecular interaction keeps this kinase inactive. But there are, uh, so this is the dominant state, but there are ways that you can activate this kinase. One that was very well known involved the, uh, the binding of a kinase of a CDC42 immediately adjacent to this intramolecular interaction. That's represented here. So this protein can uh, overcome this intramolecular interaction and so called open the uh, pocket kinase uh, of, uh, or the kinase domain of MLKs and make them available to phosphorylate the downstream MAP2 kinases. This has been described before in the literature. I was quite excited because the fact that this uh, intramolecular interaction was depending on an SH3 domain and a proline-rich region, which I already show you, uh, there's a proline-rich region in Huntington that seemed to be important for mediating the toxic effect. So that led me to speculate that perhaps uh, this proline rich domain of Huntington is somehow competing with this interaction and allowing uh, the kinase to be in the active state. So how we tested that, we assumed that if we now put a molar excess of SH3 domain in the, together with the protein, we will compete off this opening of the kinase by the mutant protein in the preparation. And when we run those experiments, here's again the same mutant protein hunting that I showed you before, but it's perfused with an excess molar of this SH3 domain that I just showed you. And you can see that that completely prevented the effect of transports in this system. However, if you put an SH3 domain that has a point mutation that does no longer allow it to bind to the proline rich domain, we actually see the effect. So what this was implying is that really uh, 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 somehow uh, the mutant Huntington has an SH3 domain uh, present in it that can actually lead to activation of the MAP kinases. And, and a good candidate for the, MAP, for the upstream MAP kinases were these mixed lineage kinases that involve uh, the interaction between the SH3 in the proline-rich domain that I just described before. Now, you, I know many of you might be asking yourselves the question, uh, so if the wild-type protein also has the proline-rich domain, because that's not what the mutation actually caused, why is it that the wild-type didn't have an effect? And the answer was given in that uh, slide that I gave you when we uh, co-perfused with antibodies. We now know that uh, somehow the wild-type protein 
uh, folds in a way that makes it not accessible, the protein domain. That was a little bit the schematic that I show you uh, for my, from my colleague, uh, Nick, Car Nick Caron. What has been shown that as the polyglutamine expand, uh, region of the protein expands, there is more exposure of that proline rich domain. And that explains why we were not able to see effects in this system with the wild type protein, but only with the mutant protein. So to make absolutely sure that this was dependent on mixed line, line edge kinases, we first tried an MLK inhibitor. And again, we found that by putting an inhibitor of that kinase upstream of junk, we blocked the effect of the mutant protein in the squid axoplasm. And it wasn't just one inhibitor, but now there's a number of inhibitors that were developed by the CHDI, uh, a nonprofit company doing research on, on, on Huntington's. And pretty much to different degrees, most of these uh, compounds were actually working quite well at inhibiting this uh, mixed lineage kinases in this preparation and blocking the effect of mutant Huntington on transport. So I actually spoke very fast because I made it to the very end today. So I'm pleased about that. So what's the model that we have right now that we're working with? Uh, well, what it appears to be the case is that in the wild type protein, we have uh, this region, the proline rich region is somehow hidden in the structure. And I don't have time to show you, but we have crystal structures showing binding of this domain to the SH3 domain of the MLK kinase. So um, the uh, normal activity of MLK is repressed by this intramolecular interaction that I, re that I referred to before. However, when the uh, polyglut polyglutamine domain gets expanded, that results in exposure of this proline rich region, which now recruits this SH3 domain of the MLK and promotes the active conformation of the protein that in turn phosphorylates the downstream uh, targets. So uh, I'm trying to remember, oh, I think I put it twice. So that's the mechanism that we're working now. And what we're trying to do is to see if we can actually start working with compounds in vivo, just like we did with the junk tree, to try to block these effects and, and try to work as early or as close as, the, uh, as, the, as we can to the initial uh, pathogenic events, which appears to be this abnormal exposure of the proline rich region. So with this information, we now can confidently say that at least in the squid, uh, these mixed lineage kinases upstream of junk appear to be activated through an allosteric mechanism uh, that involves the proline rich region of Huntington that in turn activate junk three that in turn inhibits axonal transport, and that we know already from genetics that inhibiting axonal transport causes axonal degeneration and later neuronal cell death. So what we believe our contributions have to be uh, where was to fill up some of uh, gap in our knowledge of the things that happen from the very mutation to the end uh, result of the disease. This gives us hope that perhaps pharmacological inhibitors targeting these kinases can have a potential effect, uh, ameliorative effect on the disease. Um, um, but that actually we, we will pursue these studies just like we did for the junk tree to try to address that in vivo. So, but I wanna remind you that if it wouldn't be for this wonderful creature, it would have been hard to really identified a single junk isoform, for example, or even the MLK's isoforms that I'm not gonna be able to discuss much today. So with that, I customized this, uh, this lecture for it to be quite short, but I have a number of slides that I can show if there are any questions, but I wanna thank the people that did most of the work. The people in my lab were Min Su Kang, Mercedes Priego, which I show a picture already, and Nicole Mesnar. I'm particularly thankful to my uh, former mentor, Dr. Scott Brady, which uh, actually uh, I traveled with him for over 20 years to the MBL to work with the squid and a number of different collaborators that provide us reagents and the funding that was now um, uh, is, I no longer have funding from NIH, but I left this reference because this allowed us to do some of the experiments that I did there and the CHDR foundation, which also provided funds for some of these studies. Uh, with this, uh, I think I'm going to actually cut off there. And if there's any questions, maybe Fabian, you can help me um, 
address those uh, in the chat, or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to do so.